Time for questions to the Minister for Finance. Before I go to the first question, I remind the House that questions number two, standing in the name of Mr Alec Easton, and number 11, in the name of Mr John Blair, have been grouped. I call Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number one. In line with the NDNA commitment, the Executive Subcommittee on Reform was established to consider the recommendations of the RHI report in full and to oversee their implementation. The subcommittee met for the first time in July 2020 and was scheduled to meet again on 5 November. This meeting was postponed and will be rearranged in the coming weeks. The recommendations of the report have been brigaded under seven key themes, and at the next meeting, the subcommittee will hear from each theme lead. The leads will outline the significant work already done and present for approval an action plan detailing the work ahead. The Executive Subcommittee plans to bring a full report on the actions taken and proposed for each recommendation to the full Executive and to the Assembly before the Christmas recess. Ms Armstrong. Thank you very much. Um, Minister, can you provide an update on the independent panel set up to examine the role of civil servants involved in the RHI scheme? And can the Minister provide an update on the independent panel to be established to investigate breaches of the Ministerial Code? Well, the, the, the work of the panel to, uh, to look into the disciplinary process, uh, some of those cases have been concluded and some are stayed either due to legal action or ill health, and some are ongoing with their time frames to be confirmed. Uh, I'm very limited in what I can say about that process because there's an ongoing litigation uh, that seeks to challenge the process. Uh, and uh, I, I, as I said, there are four cases that have been heard and concluded, four are stayed either due to legal action or ill health, two are ongoing. Uh, and legal correspondence has been received in respect of one of those cases. So, uh, as I said, it's, I'm very limited in what I can say in relation to them. Uh, not, uh, nonetheless, I would like to see them concluded as quickly as possible, and I hope whatever legal issues are, are involved in them are resolved as quickly as possible to bring this uh, chapter to a close. Mr. Philip McGuigan. Uh, Minister, can I ask for an update on the RHI scheme itself as per commitments in the New Decade New Approach Agreement? The, uh, well, there was a commitment in the, uh, to bring the RHI scheme to a close, and of course that is the responsibility of the Department for Economy. Uh, I know that the uh, Minister for Economy has, has brought on a number of occasions some uh, discussion on this to the Executive. Uh, I, I certainly, and I think many other Executive Ministers, share that ambition to see this scheme closed. Of course, there are outstanding issues to be addressed as a consequence of that, uh, and I, I look forward to hearing from the Minister of Economy in terms of her propositions in relation to it. Dr. Steve Aiken. Thank the Minister indeed for his remarks so far. Uh, could the Minister update us? Is, is the delay in the finding of the RHI committee and the work of the RHI committee leading to the uh, delays in recruitment for senior positions from the head of the civil service? And I understand at the moment we're still waiting for new permanent secretaries to be appointed or to go through the process of justice, education, economy, and indeed the head of the civil service. No, there is no relationship between the two issues at all. Mr. Matthew Toul. Deputy Speaker, um, can I ask um, the Minister further to the, answer, er, the answers he's given? Um, the panel, the committees that are meeting inside the executive, has any discussion or any consideration been given to underpinning any of the reforms in legislation? Thus far, the executive has been insistent that the reforms should go through via codes and guidance. Can I also ask the minister whether he can tell the House whether any members of his party referred themselves to the standards commissioner in relation to business assistance schemes? Firstly, the, it's not a matter of the executive being insistent. The, the work that is informed in the RHI subcommittee was the work that was conducted by five parties over a long period of time, of which your party was a participant. Uh, and the recommendations which the executive and the executive subcommittee are following through come from that area of work of which your party was a participant uh, in. So if you are advocating a different approach in terms of legislation now, then that's a departure from what your party had agreed uh, all along in relation to this matter. Uh, in relation to the reference to the Standards Commissioner, I have no idea if anyone has been referred or has referred themselves. Mr. Alec Easton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy uh, Principal Speaker. Um, could um, question number two? Sorry. <laughs> uh, with your permission, uh, pre last concora, I wish to group questions two and eleven. Uh, following the October monitoring round, the executive held 100.6 billion in reserve. The executive was informed by Treasury last Thursday, on the 5th of November, that it would receive an additional 400 million pounds. 
COVID-19 continues to present many challenges, and the Executive will consider how best to use this £500 million uh, for targeted support in the coming weeks and months. In addition, the following funding is also held centrally. £0.4 million held for transfer to the Department for Transport in England for the ferry operator scheme. £6 million held pending finalisation of the bus coach taxi support scheme. £22.9 million held for further sectoral support and any currently unforeseen PPE requirements, and £60 million has been held by pending the Department of Economy's development of COVID restrictions business support measures. Mr. Eason. Minister, for his answer so far. Would the Minister agree with me that it is uh, vitally important that all funding is not held centrally, that it gets out to the departments, especially health? Um, and also uh, finance so that we can tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. And can the Minister tell us what he's doing to ensure that none of that money gets handed back to Treasury? Well, can I say in relation to health, uh, we had some uh, £600 million held for a, a period of time since probably the end of the summer into early autumn. Uh, in which health were assessing how much of that that was ring fenced for health. They were assessing how much of that they could spend. They have come back in the last number of weeks to the executive to say they will spend 524 roughly million of that, uh, and that left an additional amount of money then to go into a central pot for the executive. All of that money uh, in the last week or two was allocated, uh, with 100 million being held in reserve for if further interventions were necessary, which was executive considered prudent. It was my recommendation to them. Uh, we only learnt last Thursday. That we have additional 400 million, and I mean, partly, I suppose, drifting into this morning's debate in relation to the budget bill, we have been getting a drip feed of allocations in which we are trying to respond to. Uh, if we had a full sense of the entire 2.8 billion at the start of the year, it would allow us to plan much better. But we've been a drip feed, and then we get down to the, the greatest sin of all, which is not spending out uh, some of this money. So yes, of course, there will be a challenge uh, ahead. We want to get. We've only learnt last Thursday that we have an additional amount of money. We were holding some back, uh, and that amounts now to roughly, with, so, with some of the other areas I've outlined, roughly half a billion pounds that we need to spend in the time ahead. I want to see schemes brought forward. I want to see money on the ground as quickly as we can possibly get it. Uh, I want to see it directed where it's needed. But of course, as I say, health has already taken a share of money which it said it needs for the rest of the financial year. Mr. John Blair. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for, for his answer. Also, uh, could I ask the Minister if he can provide an update at this stage on whether there is likely to be increased borrowing powers for the Northern Ireland Executive to uh, try to tackle COVID-19 and to assist in recovery measures? Also, well, I, I think the first priority will be to spend the money that we have. And as I say, uh, we were operating up until last Thursday morning on the basis that we had set aside an additional 100 million pounds to to uh, look at unforeseen circumstances in the rest of the financial year. That has now been bumped up to almost half a million. Uh, so the priority will be to spend that. We have, uh, as of Scotland and Wales, been pressing Treasury for, in principle, flexibilities in terms of borrowing, in terms of carryover, conversion of capital to resource, uh, all of those issues. We haven't had any agreement as yet, uh, any confirmation of an agreement in relation to all of that. But uh, we want, I, I think the priority will be the executive will be to spend the money we have uh, and look for, in principle, flexibilities around a range of other matters. Mr. Jim Allister. Thank you. Um, to know that there is half a billion in the, at the centre is discomforting in one sense for many businesses that are on their uppers and have not been able to access money. But more specifically, the businesses which were closed down three weeks ago and which are, were expecting to open this week again, they were promised money. I am sure I am not the only MLA to be in receipt of multiple representations from such businesses asking the simple question, where is it? So on their behalf, where is it? Well, can I say in relation to the, uh, to the LPS scheme uh, that, that uh, my own department is responsible for rolling out, uh, and I say firstly in relation to those schemes, the, uh, the issue in, in over the last number of weeks has been the fact that in the earlier schemes, it was the entirety of businesses were getting support. And when you are operating off the LPS database, then when it was restricted to hospitality, that means a differentiation has to be provided, and that requires additional data from other sources, such as uh, council environmental health sources, to differentiate between who is a shop 
as in retail, or who is a shop, as in hairdresser, or beauty salon, or, or various cafes and other aspects of that, because that's how they're, that's how they're characterised uh, under LPS. Uh, and so that has added uh, an added layer of difficulty. But the, so far, as of this morning, £7.84 million has been allocated out of that scheme to over 2,290 businesses. So the money is rolling out. It's not as fast as I would have wanted it to, uh, but it is going out there. And I'm told that there have been over 11,300 applications and that those are being worked through as quickly as possible. Mr. Patsy McLoan. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I guess we are in the and Could the uh, Minister provide an update as to how centrally held COVID-related funding will be utilised to specifically increase support for the hospitality sector in the run-up to the Christmas period? Well, there are a, a number of schemes that be put forward. Uh, as I said, uh, my own department. Uh, received £35 million for this scheme that I have just talked about, and that is to get uh, money on the ground in terms of both hospitality and uh, people in close contact services who have a business premises, because it is based on the property uh, uh, model. Economy have been wrote, there are £60 million pounds being held centrally for economy to roll out schemes in relation to other people who are in the close contact uh, and other hospitality support. Uh, and I look forward to seeing the details of that and uh, early applications for that. Uh, and of course, the executive, I think, will consider, given the uh, discussions we are currently having uh, and the possibility of an extension uh, of, of the, uh, the restrictions, then I think the executive will consider and want to act very quickly in terms of getting further support to anyone who is affected by restrictions. Mr. Chris Little. Question number three. My engagement in this case has been with the NIO, as in my view and in line with the statement of funding policy, it is for that department which has constructed the policy to deal with funding in the first instance. I and other ministers have raised this issue with the Secretary of State on a number of occasions and will continue to do so. A request was recently made to the Secretary of State by the First and Deputy First Ministers to meet with him alongside myself and the Justice Minister to discuss the matter. He has yet to agree to a meeting. However, I am determined to pursue the necessary funding. Mr. Little. Principal Deputy Speaker, thank the Minister for his update. It is a moral stain on the history of Ireland that these innocent people who suffered the most heinous injury and injustice have waited a lifetime for this victim's pension. Indeed, many have died and are dying waiting for it. I welcome the commitment given by the Justice Minister to administer the scheme, but can I ask the Finance Minister when will he meet with the UK Government to secure the funding necessary to deliver this unacceptably overdue assistance for victims? Well, as I said in my original answer, we have, we have requested a meeting with the Secretary of State. It was the Northern Ireland Office uh, that created this policy. It differed and departed from the agreement that the parties had reached in Stormont House. Uh, and that means, under their, their own rules, their own statement of funding policy, those who create the policy and legislate for it are responsible for the funding of it. Uh, we have been trying to get that discussion with the Secretary of State. We have yet, uh, even though the request has come from the Deputy First and the First uh, Minister and myself and the Minister of Justice, we have yet to secure such a meeting and we will continue to pursue that. Ms. Linda Dillon. Good privilege, Ken Corlea, and thank you to the Minister for your answers, that, answers thus far. As you have already outlined, the British Government, by their own rules, say that if you create the, pol the policy, you must pay for it. And as Mr Little has outlined, these victims have waited far too long. Could I ask the Minister, in terms of your own meeting, could you also ask that the NIO and indeed the British Secretary of State meet with these victims' groups, who have all requested meetings with him, and yet, to date, he has not responded to them? Well, I mean, I, I think that what the member outlines is, is the, I suppose, another extension of the unsatisfactory nature of uh, how this scheme has been developed and taken forward by the Northern Ireland Office. Uh, it, it, I was part of the discussions in Stormont House to reach an agreement on that. They weren't easily done. Uh, it required a lot, a lot of uh, accommodation by all five parties to that agreement. Uh, and the fact that the British government unilaterally took off in their own direction in relation to that and substantially changed that is unsatisfactory. But their handling of it since they have done that has compounded not only the, the political problems they have created uh, for all of the parties in this uh, executive, but also for the, the victims themselves. And I hope that they address all of those issues in the very near future. Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Principal Deputy Speaker, the, the Minister will be aware that it was back three months ago in August that the Executive appointed the Department of Justice to run the scheme. 
Uh, has his department had any indication from the Department of Finance with regard to the resource requirements, business plan, or any other um, preparatory work for, for running the scheme out? No, not as yet. I mean, understand that work is still ongoing in regard to the costings. I know there has been a, a huge variation in some of the public expression of what the costings might be, but we have had, had no detail in relation to that. And I have to say the absence of a discussion with the Northern Ireland Office in the middle of all this isn't assisting in the development of that uh, process. Mr Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number four, Minister. As you are aware, I have been pressing Treasury to agree a suite of budget flexibilities for the Executive, specifically the ability to switch from capital to resource, a loosening of restrictions on how much the Executive can carry forward from one year to the next, and for a pragmatic approach to budget overspends. Together with the finance ministers from other devolved administrations, I raised this issue again with Treasury on 21 October. Treasury is still considering this request, and I will continue to press for a positive outcome. Mr. Catney. For your answers so far, but Minister, what I was really trying to get at there was both the specific amount that you want to carry over and in what departments. Well, we, we're yet to come to the end of the, the, the budgetary phase. We have another January monitoring round, uh, uh, or sorry, another monitoring round in January to go through in terms of reallocation. So it's really later on in the year when you realise that. But what we want to establish, and what the finance ministers in Scotland and Wales want to establish, is a principle. Uh, that we have a very uh, small percentage of the budget can be carried over, that that is extended. Uh, and, and we may not need to use it all. We may have the ability to spend out everything that we require, although with the additional COVID allocations this year, that's going to be a challenge. Uh, and with the experience of COVID, that's going to be a challenge in terms of departmental spending. Uh, but it's in principle to establish those uh, those, those uh, conditions that allow us to carry over. So we haven't as yet identified which departments may need that or how much they may need. Mr. Pat Sheehan. Could the Minister give an update on the establishment of a fiscal commission that would consider the executive's ability to raise revenue for public services? Yes, work on both a fiscal commission and a fiscal council, which was part of the NDNA commitments, uh, had been or slowed down as a consequence of the, the overall executive response to COVID. Uh, but that work continues. I, I hope in the very, very near future to be able to bring a paper to the executive with propositions for a fiscal commission. Mr. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can the Minister outline any uh, Northern Ireland specific uh, conversations he's had with? the Secretary for the Treasury with regard to any specific asks and also any commonalities with the other devolved regions? Well, I have to say that the, uh, the, we will have a specific asks with Treasury. We have been raising the issues of the payments for the protocol for Brexit to cover that, uh, the loss of funding to here as a consequence of leaving the European Union and the replacement of all of that. So those are specific, I suppose, to here. In common with the other, uh, both Scotland and Wales, and we, we have common positions on a lot of these issues, and we have quite a lot of dialogue with both the Welsh and Finance and Scottish Finance Ministers. We have been developing uh, common asks in relation to flexibilities, uh, uh, early sight of the comprehensive spending review. Uh, early early uh, information in terms of what our funding envelope will be for next year, which are all essential in terms of planning, uh, and to ensure that uh, any uh, and I mean this has been our experience over the last year. While Barnet consequences have been very welcome, additional money for us to spend they have come and um, with little or no notification and very much a drip feed. And so the executive is responding all the time and trying to ensure that we can get that money out quickly and get the support where it's needed. So it hasn't been ideal, albeit the, the funding itself is very welcome. So those are conversations we've been having on a regular basis. Specifically to here, it's more so in and around the Brexit issues and the, the spending that we require for that. Ms. Michelle McElveen. The Belfast Region City Deal is finalising a number of outlined business cases in preparation for signing deal documents. Local partners and departments continue to work closely together in order to achieve this. I am fully supportive of the City Growth Deals Initiative, which signals our desire to build a productive, regionally balanced and inclusive economy and will provide investment and much needed jobs in local areas, offering hope for the future. I thank the, the Minister for his response. I am well, disappointed that my constituency will largely miss out on the capital spend of the proposed City Deal. I am hopeful that there will be spin-off benefits. There are naturally concerns with the focus on COVID-19 that projects will be delayed. 
Can the Minister give an assurance that there will be no undue delay to the commencement of schemes? Well, there, uh, she will know that obviously there are a number of departments and a number of councils uh, involved in all of those projects, and so uh, there are a lot of moving parts. But clearly, our intention is to try and drive those schemes on and get them done as quickly as possible. We recognise, uh, as, as part of our discussions in terms of economic recovery, that city deals are a key component part in actually stimulating economic activity, stimulating uh, construction jobs, and, and, and all of the benefits that flow from major capital projects. So there is certainly a strong desire in the executive, to, and we will continue to keep monitoring and focused on that. I know the Department of Economy will as well, as being one of the major players in relation to city deals, uh, and, and work with our council colleagues to make sure uh, that we don't experience any undue delays. Ms. Orlea Flynn. Can, call you. Um, can the Minister provide an update on any of the other city deals, please? Well, the city deals uh, partners are, are in Derry City and Straban are working closely with officials to progress the deal to ahead of terms. The deal equates to £210 million combining city deals and inclusive future fund funding with equal contributions from both the executive and the British governments. It is a welcome investment in the North West region, especially at this time. Also, in relation to other funds, I will be meeting shortly with the South West Councils uh, to discuss uh, 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 the proposals that are attached to the, the funding they have for the deals that reflect those council areas. Mr John Blair. Principal Deputy Speaker, can I ask if the Ministry can confirm if, if, if the uh, £100 million pounds City Deals complimentary fund is open, and if so, how many bids have been received? Well, I am afraid I do not have the detail on that at the moment. Uh, as, a matter, as you will know, this is a, a matter across a range of departments plus a number of council areas as well. Uh, I am not sure. Well, I know the councils have been working up proposals themselves. Uh, in, in, in relation to some of the projects they have. I know they have been having discussions across the Belfast uh, City uh, deal area in relation to that complimentary fund and what, what might flow from it. Uh, I do not believe that there have been bids received for any of that, but I am sure councils, when they were aware of that, and of course he will know that any bids have to be complimentary to the City deal projects as well, uh, that he will know that, that the uh, councils and other areas will be looking very closely at, at what they can bid for. But that process, I think, has, has yet to be uh, developed in terms of, of an allocation or uh, a consideration of allocation to, to money from that, that complementary fund. Uh, judging by his new place in the chamber, let me congratulate Mr Thomas Buchanan on his promotion. I call Mr Thomas Buchanan. <laughs> Minister, question number six. Uh, in my current role as Finance Minister, neither I nor my officials have any specific engagement with communities to discuss progress on the funding for sub-regional stadia programme for soccer. It will be for the Department of Communities to initiate engagement at an appropriate time. Mr Buchanan. Minister, I am sure you are aware that for many years soccer has been underfunded and underdeveloped as a result uh, in comparison with the Gaelic Athletic Association. Will, will you, as Minister, then give an undertaking that in your role that you will do what you can to see that uh, reversed and to see that soccer will be funded on a par with the GAA? Well, can I say, firstly, I want to see all sports adequately funded because I think sport is hugely beneficial uh, for all young people in particular and for society generally. And you can see the lack of inability to attend football matches and other sporting events uh, has, has on society. I, I disagree absolutely with his, his contention that the GA has been funded uh, to the advantage of soccer. If you take all over the years the amount of council pitches, for instance, that have been built for soccer as opposed to those, and I know this as a lifelong member of the GAA living in a rural area, uh, that any of the provisions that have been made uh, over the years for GAA were funded by GAA members themselves, not from the state, not through government departments or council fund. The vast bulk of that was funded by themselves. So I, I don't think it serves this debate any well to try and get into comparative figures as if there's some political issue in relation to this. What we need to do is try and develop as much money as we can uh, for sport. Sport makes a very a positive contribution uh, and to ensure that facilities and, and uh, supporting arrangements for sport are as well funded as we possibly can. Mr Andy Allen. 
Sure, as the Minister will be aware, uh, the sub-regional stadia programme is a commitment that sat alongside the regional stadia programme, and it has been forecast that the regional stadia programme, the final stadia of that, uh, there is a potential budget increase required in that respect. Can the Minister advise from his recent budget exercise provided from the Department of Communities whether the Minister for Communities is forecasting any increased spend in respect of the sub-regional stadia programme? Well, I have to say that the, uh, from my own perspective and from my understanding talking to officials, there is no correlation between funding for the two. Uh, and clearly, any increase in the regional stadia programme has happened as a consequence beyond the control of those people who are providing regional stadiums. Uh, and uh, clearly, there, there have been issues which have held up the delivery of that programme, uh, which weren't obviously planned for by those who are developing those plans. So I haven't had discussions in relation to that. I've had a preliminary meeting, as I have had with all of our, not all at this stage, but most uh, other ministers uh, in relation to budgetary matters. We, we can't really decide on how we're allocating budgets until we know the amount we're getting. And so we're dependent on the comprehensive spent review and as early as possible announcement from the Treasury in relation to what our budgets look like. Uh, uh, and then we'll be able to, I think, finalise those discussions as to what's required for all programmes. Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The sub-regional association football stadium funding programme was to be allocated as long ago as 2016. What funding has been allocated for this programme for the financial year 2021-2022? And is this not time to make a vital capital investment in not only sport but also construction? Well, I don't disagree with his last point in relation to that investment. I think wherever we can make, uh, get capital programmes done, then I think it contributes to economic recovery. The, the funding for 2021-22 will be allocated as part of the budget. Uh, we aren't aware as yet as to what our budget will be for 2021-22. We don't know the funding envelope that we have, and while we've been able to have preliminary discussions with departments in relation to their budgetary requirements, we haven't been able to allocate an actual spend until we know that amount ourselves. So, uh, when, we, when we are aware of what we have, then we'll be able to take decisions in relation to how we spend that. Mr. Justin McNulty. I can thank the Minister for his answers thus far. And will the Minister agree with me in terms of the incredibly important role sport plays in our society and our, our, our well being of our society and how much it's missed at the grassroots level now? We are lucky that we have the elite level and we can, we're sorry that we can't go and cheer on our team this weekend. Minister Armagh playing Donegal and Bradley Park. We both love to be there, but we can't. But we'll, we'll shout in the morning from the TV. In terms Order. of the TV, the question relates to the sub-regional stadia I'm getting there, I'm getting for there. soccer. I'm getting there. In terms of the GA, the GA only want their fair share, Minister. The GA want their fair share, and Casement Park can be a catalyst to reboot our economy. Can the Minister confirm that he is committed to providing all the funding to enable, to enable the, the construction of Casement Park and to help reboot our economy? The, uh, f firstly, I agree with him in terms of his... his uh, his outlook on sport, and, and specifically, obviously, in relation to our Maji. Uh, but uh, can I say that the commitment to casement is an executive commitment? It's a flagship project. It's a, it's a key uh, project commitment, uh, and I expect the executive to live up to that commitment. And I certainly will be playing my role in helping the executive to live up to that commitment. Yes, we both know the minister and Mr. McNulty are two orange men. Arlea Flynn. The question has been covered. Thank you, Las Concordia. Mr. Declan McAleer. That question, Adam, please. The executive agreed to terms of reference for the review on the 18th of June 2020. It is a two-stage two review. The first stage is about gathering background information from departments and is complete. The second stage is desk-based within the Department of Finance and involves looking at the rationale for an arm's length body, considering whether the functions it carries out can be delivered in the department itself. Does it require political impartiality? Does it have a technical function that would be inappropriate for a department to carry out? Are there overlaps with other arm's length bodies? Has it outlived its purpose? Should it be abolished? Does it have sufficient transparency to the public about its activities, and could that be improved? That work is almost complete and will be brought to the executive when finalised. It will include proposals for the rationalisation, efficiency and effectiveness of arm's length bodies considered in the review. Mr. McAleer. Um, Graham Algar, thank the Minister for his response. Could the Minister provide us with an update on civil service reform? Thank you. Well, that, that civil service reform, I suppose the two issues are, are obviously linked, uh, and they are part of the broad NDNA commitments uh, to, to reform civil service. I have been developing uh, propositions in relation to civil service reform, and I hope to be bringing a paper to the executive in the not-too-distant future, uh, outlining a process uh, for initiating a, a very wide-ranging reform of the civil service. Mr. Matthew O'Toole. 
Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, given what the Minister has just said about the importance of civil service reform, when will a head of the civil service be appointed? Well, the, the issue of uh, a non-appointment was, uh, was within the TEO. Uh, I know that they are looking at interim measures, and I want to see uh, a head of civil service appointed as soon as we possibly can. Uh, but uh, we have to obviously look at the process in the interim and then look at a uh, more permanent replacement for the head of the civil service, and I hope that will be done as quickly as possible. Thank you, Minister. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Ms Claire Bailey. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister for Finance what, if any, support packages, financial support packages have been discussed for those who might self-isolate or required to self-isolate? Well, I know that uh, under the uh, leadership of Terry Hargy, before she went off uh, with illness uh, and further developed with Carly Cullen in the Department of Communities, there have been an extension of support for those who have to isolate. This has been discussed, I think, at almost every executive meeting that we have discussed financial support packages. And what we want to see is clearly the issue of compliance is people following the message, people following regulations, but also people being able to do that. And if we have a situation where people who are required to isolate cannot afford to do so, or the consequences of that become very difficult for them and their families, then the executive, I think, need to make sure that we provide sufficient levels of support. So I know the Department of Communities have been focused on that. I know there is already a support mechanism there. I think we want to ensure that that's as, as good as it can be and that when we get particularly to this crucial stage of the year where compliance will be, will be even more important than ever, that we, we assist people in compliance, not just a matter of enforcing things, but we provide assistance to do that. Ms Bailey. I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, Minister, has finance been set aside to do that work or are we still just discussing it? Well, as I say, there already is a, a scheme within uh, uh, the Department of Communities. Uh, there are finances available. I have said uh, to executive colleagues, and including the Communities Minister, that uh, if there are additional support measures need to be brought in to assist with people in isolation and assist in compliance, then I am very happy to consider those. Uh, we have now, as of last Thursday, additional money, uh, and I think compliance is going to be a key issue over the next number of months. And I, I would agree. Uh, and, and support any propositions to assist people uh, in, in isolating and make sure that they can afford to do so. Mrs. Martina Anderson. Can I uh, ask the Minister how the new procurement board will promote social value so that government spending um, will address issues like poverty and deprivation, particularly in my constituency of Derry? Well, we, we have propositions uh, put forward uh, for the procurement board at, at uh, it was not had intended to meet uh, recently, but because the proposals to actually revamp the procurement board uh, were put in place, we, we need to seek additional personnel uh, to go on to that and to change the, the makeup of the procurement board. Uh, clearly, social value uh, is a key part of that, and procurement can be used as a very effective tool for achieving social outcomes. Uh, and we have had discussions with them. I know that the procurement uh, people within the department have been working on policies in relation to that. We would. Uh, if the time frame allows us also consider legislation, uh, if that were required in the, in the next year before the end of the mandate, to uh, enforce social value in terms of procurement. Procurement from the executive is a huge amount of money. It can not only be used to stimulate economic growth, but it can be used in social value as well. And we want to ensure that that is a key part of government procurement and all public bodies as well. Mrs Anderson. I think most people will be glad to hear you say that uh, the Social Value Act is one that you would like to see being taken forward in this mandate. And given that I believe something in the region of £3 million is spent year on year on procurement, so could I ask you in the propositions that you mentioned, uh, are you engaging or will that board be able to engage with other government departments to ensure that they embrace social value? It, well, it's three billion pounds actually. So procurement has a, an overarching function for the entire executive, and indeed, uh, given advice to public bodies generally. Uh, and so, any policies which would be executive policies, any any policies which the procurement board uh, would uh, adopt, would be uh, decided by the executive. So, therefore, there would be across all executive departments. 
Uh, I think what we need to put a focus on, uh, I suppose, is one thing having policies and having policies agreed and a procurement board pursuing them. It's implementation. It's making sure departments follow through, right down through the levels of all the responsibilities, them, their arms length bodies, and indeed the influence of other public bodies as well. So there's going to be a key focus in terms of those policies, but also in terms of implementation to make sure that that's carried through. Mrs. Joanne Bunting. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware that in August the COVID death toll across the UK was reduced by 5,377 after a data review in England because people were being counted as having died from COVID regardless of when they tested positive. And given in the next set of questions there's one from my colleague Ms Bradley, there seems to be some indication that people can even test positive in absentia. Um, could I ask the Minister, has any such data review been conducted in Northern Ireland and what were the findings? Well, I think the, the, uh, the uh, NISRA uh, continuously do conduct or uh, 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 ensure that their statistics and their, uh, their processes are as up to date as possible. She, the member will be aware that this is it's, it's a very difficult area because there are people who die from COVID and there are people who die with COVID. Uh, people who have maybe other conditions and, and have acquired COVID uh, while they've been treated for perhaps other issues which may have been terminal. Anyway, so it's a, it's a complex area. It requires not only the, the, the issues that are identified in a death certificate then to be followed through in terms of statistical representation of all of that, which is a complex and obviously a very, very sensitive area as well. And undoubtedly, COVID is a new experience for health departments and statistical agencies as well. Uh, and, and trying to develop a response to that has been challenging for people. Uh, so I'm not surprised that there are some issues have arisen in other areas. But I, I want to ensure that NISTRA, who represent that agency work uh, here for us, that they are on top of that as best they possibly can be. Because I recognise that there is a sensitivity for families if somebody has been incorrectly identified uh, as having died of something when that isn't the case. And so I think it's 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 an area that I know they are very conscious of. Uh, that the complexity of it, but also the sensitivity of it, and I think that that's something we need to ensure happens on the way forward. Ms. Bunting. Grateful to the Minister for that answer, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, because in a written answer to me, he advised that as of June 2020, which was the most up-to-date figure, the data showed that 754 people out of 830 of those who had COVID mentioned on their death certificates, and this is here in Northern Ireland, were subsequently coded by the Office of National Statistics as having died from it. Now, given the different treatment of the remains of those who are cited to have died as a result of COVID and the lack of dignity and the considerable distress that this causes to their loved ones, what is being done to ensure much greater accuracy uh, with regard to death certificates? Well, as I say, it, primarily the, the, the responsibility of that comes from the certifying doctor when somebody has died. To, to, so the, the job of the statistics agency is really to transfer that into data. Uh, and so, it, it, I suppose, in the initial uh, circumstances, it's the certification of death that, that, that will identify uh, how a person dies. And I, I agree with the member; these are hugely sensitive. The death of, of a relative is difficult enough to cope with without the additional uh, added pain that it, the restrictions, perhaps, on how that death is, is dealt with by a family and how the, the funeral arrangements are made, uh, is, is very very uh, challenging for, for a lot of families. So I think it has to be done as sensitively and as accurately as it possibly can, but it's not just one specific uh, section involved in this. There, there are the recording of those and there the transferring of those into statistical arrangements. So I, I think in the first instance, uh, what dictates how a funeral uh, operates is really done by whoever certifies the death and how they certify that death. Mr. Robin Newton is not in his place. Mr. Patsy McGloom. You, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, I guess Moehius as an Ira and a Fregidi at Togogaji Shaw. Um, could I ask the Minister, um, it's been reported that some 2,170 applications have been made to the COVID restrictions business support scheme. Could the Minister uh, specifically advise us how many of those have actually been paid? Because people are finding it extremely hard at the moment to even feed their families. And all of us, I'm sure, are receiving emails and uh, messages about that. If the minister could assure us of those grants getting out and how many have got out so far, please. First instance, that it is not as fast as I would have wanted it to be, uh, and it is because there is more than one set of data required in order. The initial run out of these through LPS was much more straightforward because there were it was across a range of sectors of uh, uh, of, of business premises. This is specific. 
to, uh, to some sectors, uh, hospitality and close contact services. Uh, but there actually have been over 11,300 applications uh, for support. So far, there's almost 8 million has been paid out uh, to businesses. That is just 2,290 businesses. Uh, I think there's about 300 applications that have been identified thus far as not meeting the criteria, and that probably will grow as the assessments continue. But I think the, with the initial hold-ups in terms of that uh, data processing and, and getting correct data from other sources uh, seems to have been addressed now, and I expect the payments to roll out now much more quickly. In relation to other schemes that have been done by the Department of Economy, for instance, I, I don't have the detail of how many have applied under those or how quickly that money is getting out, but this is in relation to the scheme that has been managed by LPS. Mr. McGlone. We have uh, Lishan Eirast and Ragnarsh, and uh, thank the Minister for his response. Could, could the Minister please advise or assure us that if there is an extension to close down for specific businesses or specific sectors, that the money will be applied to support those sectors, and that assurances again that the money will be got out as efficiently as humanly possible, because people are really, really feeling the bite. Yes, I can assure him of that, and I, I absolutely understand <coughs> the, the difficulties for businesses. Uh, I mean, I hear from them myself. I'm an elected representative, the same as everybody else. Uh, and the intention is to get that money onto the ground as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, as I say, there have been hold-ups in terms of, of verification of other sources of data. That seems to have been addressed, by now, and the scheme has been rolling out and gathering pace ever since those issues were addressed. And so I absolutely understand the necessity of that. And also, if, the, if there are an extension in terms of restrictions to some business, we need to ensure that those payments get out, because people are really, really struggling uh, to keep the businesses afloat. And, and we have a set aside money to support them. We need to make sure that money gets them as quickly as we can. Mr. Philip McQuiggan. Uh, uh, with the end of the implementation period uh, fast approaching, Minister, can I ask what certainty have the British Government provided uh, with regard to meeting the cost of Brexit? Well, we have, we have uh, gathered up uh, from a number of departments the, uh, the, the cost of the protocol. Uh, that is some of the arrangements that have been made in the ports, primarily from DERA, uh, but some other costs as well. Uh, and we have recently had confirmation from the, the British Treasury that they have they are going to accept those costs that we have presented them. The Department of Finance present them to the Treasury. Of course, there are a lot of the more we actually go through this with departments in terms of looking at their budgets, there are an awful lot of other costs associated with Europe that we don't necessarily identify that aren't about implementation of the protocol, but costs that individual departments got. Not, not uh, huge amounts, uh, but when you add them all together, significant amounts. So outside of the big headline figures around you know, the European social funds and the other funds, the agricultural funds, there are a range of costs in, in departments, smaller costs that are associated with, with Europe, that Europe had been providing support for over the years. Uh, and so I think we want to identify all of those to make sure, obviously, the priority is in terms of implementation of the protocol. Uh, and making sure that we can do that, uh, and making sure that the effect of Brexit are as, as reduced as they possibly can be, because we know they're going to be bad, no matter how, how much reduction we put in there. Uh, but there are a range of costs, I think, still to be bottomed out in terms of a loss to executive departments. Plus, we have no certainty in relation to the Shared Prosperity Fund and what it will look like and how it will be delivered. And all of these questions at this stage, I think it, it's unacceptable that we're still seeking answers in relation to Mr. McGuigan. Uh, and Minister, thank you very much for your response. Uh, and given that the North has been pulled out of the EU against their will, and given the fact that you, you've uh, alluded to additional costs uh, that still have to be bottomed out, I mean, do you think, uh, Minister, the British government should meet the broader economic costs of Brexit in terms of lost trade and employment? Well, I think, as I, you mean, and this is, is being party to the discussions, the Brexit discussions that the executive does every week. There clearly will be a cost in terms of implementation of the protocol, but there is going to be a cost to businesses to try and meet whatever new requirements there are. Uh, those aren't factored in, and they haven't been, uh, if you like, uh, calculated yet. Uh, and so, I mean, I, I share his point. We've been taken into the situation against our own democratic wishes. Uh, the British government have said we're going to be better off as a consequence of leaving the European Union. I have yet, as finance minister, to see very much evidence of that. Uh, but I think we should do our best to identify not only the cost to the executive. Uh, and the loss of funds from Europe, but the cost to businesses and to other sectors of society to try and to cope with the abrupt exit from Europe as well, uh, and we should be presenting those to Treasury. We have probably just enough time for one question and one answer, Mr Mike Nesbitt. 
Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I'd be grateful for the Minister's assessment of, of all monies and funds at risk of having to be returned to the Treasury come financial year end. Well, as I say, we have yet to have another monitoring round in terms of reallocation of executive budgets. We have, as I've identified in earlier parts of the discussion, only from last Thursday. I mean, this time last week we were discussing this in terms of £100 million pounds the executive had held over if you like, for, uh, in, in a prudent fashion to try and, and meet any unforeseen challenges or any repetition of some of the current challenges that we are facing. That is now almost a half, a half a billion pounds that we have to, and that is a significant amount to try and ensure it is spent out before the end of the financial year on top of the budgets departments already have. So that is a challenge. It is one that I will be talking to executive colleagues about this week. Uh, I think we need to ensure to do that. But we have had a range of issues raised with us, including support for isolation. Uh, and other you know, people who are forced to be at home over the winter, and some additional payments in terms of fuel and things like that. Uh, so th there are a range of I think, issues that can be met from that. We need to ensure that that money is spent out, because, as always with this place, the greatest sin is in returning money. Uh, and sometimes that doesn't lead to the type of planning or long-term strategic thinking, but the priority is just to get that money spent. But there are a lot of challenges out there in society. What we need to do is identify where they are. and, and the, the primary thing is to get money to support people quickly, uh, and we have four months to do that, and I think we should be uh, attempting to do that very, very quickly. Thank you, members. That concludes questions to the Finance Minister. If I could ask members just to take their ease for a few moments. The next item of business will be questions to the Minister for Health. And if, don't forget to clean the surfaces and stuff as you leave the chamber. Thank you.